All right, everyone, welcome to DrupalCon Amsterdam. <laughs> it is my pleasure to be getting us all invited here, and welcome to DrupalCon. Uh, today we're going to hear from 10 different leaders of the Drupal community, all of whom are making Drupal better in different ways. Uh, we hope to have time for questions at the end. So if you have questions that you would like to ask of any of these leaders in our community, please use the hashtag Drupal Initiatives. And we will be asking questions as many as we can at the end. Uh, my name is Drew Gordon. I'm the Director of Developer Relations here at, Pan at Pantheon. Um, and I I'd like to start by just recognizing the fact that all of us are here to learn from each other, to get better at what we do, to have some improvements. And I'd like all of you actually just to take a moment to look to your left and your right in front of you, around you, and welcome the people who are next to you. We're all here together, so take a moment, do it. Go ahead, everyone, please welcome everyone. All right, hopefully all of you have just made some new connections. Remember these people, we're all here. Talk to them. We're all here to learn from each other and help each other. There's a chance that you can help the person next to you or they can help you. So keep these connections alive, talk to them. Not now, not during the keynote, <laughs> but please do it sometime this week. Uh, in that spirit, I also wanna say thank you for making us feel welcome. So I work with Pantheon. Uh, this is our first DrupalCon where we have European data residency. We are really excited about that. Uh, we started this in the summer, and many of you have already reached out to us, and we've started working together, and we're super, super excited and want to say thank you to all of you who have done that. If you haven't yet started working with us, we would love to talk to you. Um, we have a booth here. We have, uh, we're printing these wonderful shirts. Please come by, have a conversation with us. We would love to talk to you uh, and give you a shirt as well. In Drupal, we have this saying that you come for the code and you stay for the community. And that's certainly been my experience. I am really excited about the fact that here today we have 10 really awesome people who are all, again, helping Drupal get better in different ways. Um, I hope this is a new tradition uh, to help lead future DrupalCons, where we hear, again, from the community leaders. So please join me in welcoming to the stage uh, our, our 10 community leaders, starting with Tara King, my friend and colleague. I am Tara, as Drew said. I um, work at Pantheon in our developer relations department. You probably know me from the internet as Sparkling Robots on Drupal.org or Twitter. I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the US, but today I'm here to talk to you as a leader of Drupal diversity and inclusion. Drupal diversity and inclusion was founded in 2016 by Nikki Stevens. This is an entirely volunteer working group as everyone is in Drupal in some ways. And we are here to continue the conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Drupal community, as well as to provide a safe space to have that conversation and also to support our underrepresented and marginally, marginalized colleagues in Drupal and in tech generally. In 2019, we're working on speaker diversity. We know that having more diverse voices on stage is gonna have a ripple effect into the audience, we're gonna have more diverse voices there, more diverse talks, and overall a healthier and stronger Drupal community. So, to that end, we started wondering, what, what can we do to help with this problem? We hear a lot from camp organizers. Camp organizers want to help as well, um, but it's hard to recruit when your network doesn't look the diverse, it's hard to recruit when your organizing team isn't diverse, and you know, it's a volunteer organization, there's limited time and resources. So that's one side of the puzzle. On the other side, for the speakers, well, I mean, we all know it can be very intimidating to get up in front of a group and speak, um, but when you're marginalized in a community, that feeling is really amplified. It increases the self-doubt, it increases the imposter syndrome, um, and it can be really hard to speak in an event where you're not totally sure that you're welcome. Additionally, for underrepresented speakers, there's often barriers like time, money, family care, all kinds of issues like that. So how can we bring these groups together? Mark Drummond, who's from Drupal Diversity on the far side, and Jill Binder is from the WordPress community. They met in 2018 at DrupalCon Nashville. Uh, Jill had been doing speaker workshops in the WordPress community designed to improve speaker diversity and wanted to share her knowledge with the Drupal community. So we talked, and it turns out her workshops really work. 
In 2018, she gave them in 12 different cities in six countries. Those communities went from 10% or fewer underrepresented speakers to 50% or more. It was a huge impact in a very short time, very lightweight. So we knew we wanted to bring this to Drupal, but we needed funding. So we talked to Pantheon, who provided half of the funding as a match, which meant we needed our community to step up and finish the fundraise. We used Open Collective um, and had over 40 individuals and uh, companies in the Drupal space donate money. It was an astonishing effort. We are super happy. This is only a uh, few people who are involved. But once we finally got the funding, we were able to hire Jill to do the workshops. The workshops covered how to write a pitch, how to write, uh, pick your topic, your bio, your speaker, uh, speaker bio, all of that stuff. So anything you really need to do a Drupal camp or con successfully, as well as a few things that are targeted specifically at underrepresented people. Again, going back to that sort of uh, exaggerated imposter syndrome effect that can happen. Jackie here is one of our attendees. She is from Los Angeles and she's a first generation American. She always wanted to speak, but she felt like she didn't really have anybody that looked like her to inspire her to do so. But after the workshops, she's now really excited to submit talks all around Los Angeles about her specialty of email marketing. Overall, we saw an increase in speaker confidence of 66%, which is a huge, huge improvement. 30% of our attendees are ready to give talks tomorrow. 30% are getting ready, they're on their way. And 20% said they would like to bring this back to their own community to be able to spread the impact of this work and get more voices on stage. So we're planning a workshop. You can sign up too. Um, it is basically three short hours to help you have all the tools you need to give this workshop in your local community. Um, we do find that an underrepresented person giving the, the workshop helps because people can see themselves reflected and represented. But everyone's welcome to attend. It's going to be on Saturday, November 16th. Uh, it is on Zoom, so you can attend anywhere in the world. Uh, it's going to be at 7 o'clock Amsterdam local, but anyone can come. You can sign up there, bit.ly slash ddi dash AMS, and yes, the capital letters do matter. Um, so you can sign up for that. We highly encourage everyone. We also have a session tomorrow. We're talking about this initiative and many, many other things we're doing in Drupal Diversity. It's going to be at 4.15 in G105. Please come down. We're going to have a lot of time for question and answer. We want to hear your thoughts about what will make this community healthy and happy. That's it. Thanks so much for your time. Happy DrupalCon, everybody. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Sean. I'm Sean B. on Drupal.org. And I'm one of the leads of the media initiative and also one of the maintainers of the media and media library module in core. And I've been doing this together with Christian Fritsch, Fenna Proxima, and Marcos Cano. I got inspired to work on the initiative back at DrupalCon Dublin. And I've not been doing a lot of core development before that time. But I did always want to contribute more. So since the lack of support for media in Drupal core was always kind of frustrating to me, I thought it was a good place to start helping out. And I got really overwhelmed at the start. It was, I really feel like I jumped in the deep end. But over the years, I got to work with a lot of smart and inspiring people who really uh, helped me understand Drupal a lot better, but also became a better developer and programmer uh, yeah, at the same time. And I think that's also the reason why I love working on Core so much. Even though the process can be quite slow and painful at times, I think the people you work with are amazing. It's really some of the best out there. And also, the fact that you help shape the future of Drupal is really something I enjoy. For the media initiative in particular, I love the fact that it's very visible work. So we have a lot of user-facing features. And since I studied interaction design, I really love working on things where humans and machines interact. And also the fact that a lot of sites could potentially use the media module is also something I really uh, like to work on. Um, from a technical perspective, I love the complexity of the module. So we have custom entities, custom plugin types, we uh, have widgets, a lot of super advanced AJAX stuff. And uh, yeah, there's really a lot to learn and a lot to uh, enjoy at the same time, really. So I keep learning uh, a lot. And since we have a lot of user-facing features, we also work a lot with the UX and uh, accessibility teams. And working with them really help put more focus on uh, UX and accessibility in general, and that not only benefits the initiative, but also work uh, the, the work I do besides Drupal Core. 
as an initiative, we try to get together a lot. Um, we did some dedicated sprints in Berlin and in Barcelona. And we also tried to meet up at things like DrupalCon and Dev Days and stuff like that. And we get to share ideas, we get to collaborate in real life and build consensus at times. And it's not only very important and helpful, but it's also really fun to do. For the last couple of years, we tried to get the media library module uh, ready. Um, we started last year with a sprint in Barcelona where we got together with some core committers, people from the UX team and product managers and rethink and redesign the library with all the lessons we learned in the past. And one thing we decided on was to design the new media library with some constraints in mind, which is also not very Drupal-y. Instead of trying to solve all use cases super flexibly, we just tried to focus on the most important things and just do them really well. And that really benefited the end result, if you ask me. So for the future, we uh, are first trying to get the media library module stable which is very close, but I'm not really sure we're going to make 8.8, .8, but hopefully we do. And after that, we have some important UX and accessibility improvements to make, so that's also something we really want to work on for Drupal 9. And after that, we try to get the media and media library module enabled in the standard profile. And since a lot of people got together and worked so hard on the media and media library module, I think it's also important to thank everyone. I'm really proud of what we accomplished, and proud of all the people who worked on it, so uh, a big thanks to everyone involved. But at the same time, I also want to ask everybody here to uh, try and help us out where you can, not only writing patches, uh, but also just installing the module, testing it, seeing how we can improve and give us feedback. It's really important, and uh, yeah, hopefully you can help us out. So uh, thank you. All right, workflow initiative. I want to start by thanking everyone who's been involved with this in initiative for the last couple of years. It's been a lot of people that has helped in all sorts of ways. Uh, if you're on the screen, or if you know that you've contributed in any other way, please stand up. Andre, I see you. Come on. <laughs> A round of applause, everyone. It really has been quite a uh, journey. Um, five years, give or take, uh, we've been involved with trying to make this work. Uh, if, you, if you appreciate all the work that all these uh, contributors have, have done, uh, do uh, send a tweet with the hashtag workflow initiative and, and celebrate with us on, on Twitter. We've, we've really come through some, some quite major achievements uh, during the, uh, these years. I'm not going to go through this list in great detail because each and every item is almost a major initiative in and of itself. But notably, uh, a long list of entity types have been converted to be revisionable and publishable. We've committed three new modules to core uh, that work with draft revisions in, in different ways. And we've also uh, fixed a long list of, of bugs. But all good things do unfortunately come to an end as well. Drupal 8.8 .8 will be our final major milestone, for now at least. Uh, the initiative, uh, initiative will effectively go into maintenance mode, and we're going to keep taking care of the modules that we've uh, contributed and all the functionality. And we're going to look for a new ways of kind of sustaining this work uh, into the future. Sustaining open source is really hard. Uh, five years of development can be as much as you know, multi-million dollars uh, worth of investment for a company or for an organization that wants to do something like this. I keep thinking a lot about this. There's been a lot of discussion in the community as well of how we make this work. Uh, and I kind of want to figure out how we can do this more uh, in repeatable patterns and enable more companies and organizations to do the same. In fact, uh, I'm going to talk in much more detail about this on Wednesday at quarter past five in room G107. So do come and join me there. Uh, for the Workflow Initiative, it's been more or less uh, a single company that has kind of uh, been driving this. And it's been a fine balance between you know, figuring out what the community wants and what we want to get out of the initiative as well. 
Uh, some, in this session, I'm going to give some of my uh, own opinions on what we can do better as organizations and also as a community. I'm going to wrap this up by talking about a new exciting feature that we're looking to get into 8.8, .8, something we call hierarchical workspaces. But I'll start by exp explain, explaining, first of all, what a workspace is. So a workspace is this isolated place on your site where you can work on multiple changes uh, at, one, at one time and publish them at the same time. Hierarchical workspaces then enables multiple workspaces to, to play together. Imagine you run a magazine and you, you want to start preparing your winter issue with lots of draft content. Um, but at the same time, you want to start preparing your New Year issue. New Year happens during winter, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so you want to work on these things at the same time. So the way it works is that published content is automatically inherited downwards so that Grace and, and Margaret here in this case can kind of work on these changes together where Margaret inherits all the changes that Grace is working on in the winter issue. And then they can merge and publish changes upstreams, upstream. And I'm going to uh, show a demo here in just a moment. So on the left, we have the live workspace. We'll switch over to the winter issue workspace in just a moment. And on the left, we have uh, Margaret. She's working on the New Year issue workspace. So we're going to start by making some changes um, in the winter issue uh, workspace. The changes that Grace is uh, doing here will be automatically inherited down to the New Year issue so that, Mar so that Margaret on the right-hand side can work on her New Year uh, things at the same time. So we're saving these changes, uploading a new image, and we can preview this one change or multiple other changes uh, at one time. And if we reload this child workspace effectively, we can see that the changes have been inherited downstream. So now Margaret, in this New Year issue workspace, she's going to do some additional changes. She wants to start preparing for New Year's, so she's going to remove uh, a redundant article from the front page and do some changes to this uh, lovely milk chocolate recipe here. So we're changing the title and, and doing a, another few bits and pieces. And what's important to understand here is that the changes done uh, downstream here will not leak upwards, so to speak, to, to the parent workspace. So we can uh, review all of these multiple changes uh, together. So we can see the changes here. And if we reload the winter issue workspace on the left-hand side, we won't see those changes there yet because the workspaces aren't merged yet. So you can see how they differ at this time. If we're happy, uh, we maybe want to then bring together these changes and start publishing them. So what we can do here is that we merge this content upstream. We see that there's two changes. We removed an uh, uh, article from the front page and we updated an image. And we can now see that these downstream changes are now reflected upstream after that merge. And now if we want to go ahead and publish this, three changes will be published. The one workspace, the, uh, the one change that Grace already did, along with the two other that Margaret worked on. We can go and these changes that we've been talking about should then be if we switch to the live workspace here. And that's it. All right. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Cristina Chumillas, a uh, secretary on Drupal.org. I'm a front end developer at Lulabot, and I'm UX core maintainer, and also I'm one of the leads of the admin UI and JavaScript modernization initiative but I'm just one of the persons uh, helping on the initiative, so there are several names there that are helping. So everything started a few years ago. Several initiatives, well, two initiatives started at Vienna, and we came together and joined the, uh, joined the work at Frontend United last year, and recently we reached our first milestone, having Claro as a, an experimental theme into Drupal core. 
So the, the initiative has several parts. One, is, one of them is the JavaScript app. Another one is the user research that was done a while ago, and also the Drupal design system. And all of them are trying to implement changes into Drupal core, several of them are already there. Uh, one of the main challenges that we've had so far is we, that we didn't have enough designers to get uh, and work uh, on the new design system, so it was blocking a lot uh, the initiative. So if you know designers that know Drupal, please explain them that there's an initiative for this. One of the things, one of the tools that we've been using is uh, Figma that was uh, uh, at, uh, at the beginning uh, one of the great resources because it was several designers working at the same time in the same document uh, from several places in the world. So it, uh, it was really, really helpful to have this sense of a team. Another thing that really worked well was uh, the collaboration between uh, designers and developers because we've listened a lot um, when things couldn't actually be implemented or where some things like wasn't, weren't good enough on an accessibility perspective. So it's been a really good thing. Another thing that has been a challenge is uh, that every design needed to be super flexible because you know Drupal, you can just enable some more modules and everything changes. So the UI that we were presenting had to be super flexible for and give solutions for anything that Drupal can show. Another thing that really worked well was the iteration uh, over the feedback that we were getting from people. Uh, one of the examples were, was, for example, this on, uh, on the left, you can see the first designs that we had for fields, and then we, we jumped over uh, for the focus into something that was more general. And also something that we need to take care of is that we can't actually break people's uh, Drupal because we are uh, working on an administration theme, and uh, we need to be sure that everybody just keeps the same interface when they update their Drupal site. And something that we also needed to take into account is the backwards compatibility, because um, as I was saying, we can't change people's interfaces, and if they are used to have things on one place, they will need to have it everywhere uh, after updating. And changing the layout, for example, something that we want to do. Could, wasn't possible to do that just on a small release. So uh, something that it will be important you to remember is that now is beta, now is an experimental core, Claro is in there, so please test it because we need to find all the bugs as soon as we can so we can have a stable release ideally and hopefully for the next um, Drupal release. Something that we struggled a bit was the communication. Um, it's been a little bit hard, as you've seen, there are several parts of the initiative. So it's been really uh, hard to communicate what was the state of the, of the, of the initiative, each part uh, to find the same goals and um, work together on things. So uh, an opportunity that we have right now being into Drupal core is that we will be able to have the new documentation so we will need a lot of people actually updating this documentation. Here's the, there's the, the link where you can actually go and help, uh, test Claro and help creating this documentation so we can get more people helping there. We'll have, uh, if you want to see the new design, we'll have a session on Wednesday morning and please come on Thursday to the sprints, we'll be there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ted Bowman, uh, Ted Bowman, Drupal.org. I work for Acquia as part of the Drupal Acceleration team, and I'm the, one of the co-maintainers of the Layout Builder module. Uh, so the beginnings of the Layout initiative for Drupal 8 um, so it started with the, the seed started back in 2006 with the first release of the Panels module and continued with modules such as Display Suite and Context. Um, and though a lot of good development went in, into those modules, we have a lot more people to thank uh, than that. Um, throughout the next decade, a lot of users pushed mod these modules in new ways that the developers hadn't imagined, and they provided valuable feedback from real world use cases, improving the developer, site builder, and end user experiences of these modules. They filed bug reports and provided patches that improved all these modules. 
At the height of Drupal 7, half of all Drupal sites either had panels, context, or display suite installed. Obviously, this was something that Drupal sites needed. Deciding which so solutions to use, though, was often daunting for new and even experienced Drupal users. So the layout initiative in Drupal 8 was an attempt to learn from all these solutions in this space. It tried to make, strived to make the system that could be used out of the box by site builders and content authors, but also could be extended in new ways by developers. Additionally, it was formed by regular meetings with the Drupal UX team and input from Drupal's accessibility maintainers. Layout Builder was marked stable in Drupal 8.7, and now the contributed module space is exploding with useful modules that extend Layout Builder. I'll list a few here today, but there are many more. Maybe some more will be made this week. Layout Builder restrictions allows you to streamline the Layout Builder interface for site builders and content authors. The Layout Builder library module allows you to make pre-made layouts for your content authors to select from. And Layout Builder styles allows themers to create predefined styles to apply to your sections and blocks. For translations, we have two modules. Um, uh, layout Builder symmetric translation keeps your layouts in sync across all your translations, but allows you to have custom translations of your inline blocks and other strings, while Layout Builder asymmetric translations allows each language to have a totally independent layout with unique blocks. It's often more used for localization. Um, currently, it is easier than ever to get involved with the work of the Layout Initiative. Uh, the long slog of getting Layout Builder stable is over. There are many features that are being worked on that need help for many different types of users. So for Drupal 9, as we look forward to Drupal 9, these modules and real world use cases of Layout Builder will inform the future of Layout Builder and Layout in general in core. As much as the contrib modules such as panels, context, and display suite also led to the Drupal 8 layout initiative itself. So what's next? What features of these modules do we think belong in core? What features of Layout Builder are currently missing? What is the 80% use case of Layout Builder? Should the Layout API use be, in, used, be used in new ways inside Drupal core? So how can you help? We need help from, if you're a core contributor working on improving Layout Builder in core, you're part of the Layout Builder initiative. If you're a module developer building great things on top of Layout Builder and the Layout API, you're part of the Layout Initiative. If you're a site builder putting all of these things together in new ways that nobody has thought of yet, you're also part of the Layout Initiative. If you're a content author using any and all of these, all of the above on a daily basis, then you're also part of the Layout Builder Initiative. So it's up to us here and everybody in the larger Drupal community to uh, decide you know, what the shape of layouts is in Drupal 9 and beyond. Um, there's a lot of possibilities that could happen and so um, we need feedback from as many people as possible and just like all the other initiatives um, up here, we're always looking for, for people that can help, developers, um, people with UX experience, in all kinds of different experience. We have a couple sessions this week. Tomorrow, Tim Plunkett, uh, co-maintainer of the Layout Builder module, is doing what's next for the Layout Initiative, so he'll go in much more depth than I did. And on Wednesday, Boris, or Boyan Borsovov, sorry for your name, <laughs> Mitz Brown's your name, is doing a looking at a larger scope of the Layout Builder module ecosystem. And on Thursday, uh, please come to the contribution day. Uh, where you can help on Layout Builder core issues, but also I'm sure a lot of the contrib modules out there if you want to help on those. Uh, so thanks a lot, and we look forward to you getting involved. Hello, and welcome to some story time about configuration management from Drupal 8.0 to 8.8. .8. Um, you know, um, Configuration management has been a new feature for, to Drupal 8, and there was a CMI that was successfully completed for the first release of Drupal 8. I'm Fabian Bircher, I work for Nuvole, and I'm a co-initiative lead for CMI 2, and I maintain a couple of uh, fairly popular 
contrib modules that deal with configuration. Um, for example, config split um, has recen recently reached uh, 1 million downloads on Drupal.org. So uh, Drupal 8.00 came with this amazing new feature. It allowed you to uh, export all your configuration and then import all your configuration again. But unfortunately, um, that, that was it. And um, for example, development modules were not something that you could do. So Drush, already before uh, 8.0 was shipped, had um, a flag that you could add to the import and export commands that would allow you to skip modules. So you, you can have your development modules and then skip them and they wouldn't be exported. Unfortunately though, um, there was a bug and the dependencies of these modules were still exported and, and not skipped. Um, but this feature in, in Drush was built on a, on a very simple configuration filter approach. And then um, in, in 2016, um, I created uh, a module called config split that built on top of this uh, configuration filter approach but completed it. Um, and it would split the development modules uh, together with their uh, config dependencies in, into a separate folder. Um, based on this, then later also came like the sort of API part of it, uh, config filter. But it was not feature equivalent. You could not just give it a list of modules that you, you would never want to export. Um, so someone created an issue and then, um, because this was not really a good fit for it, created a, a separate um, module called config exclude that did that. Changing gears a bit, uh, in uh, early 2018, we decided that it, we wanted to build a better um, core way of doing configuration management, so we started a, a new initiative. And um, we, we met at the, the developer days, but then um, around Drupal Europe one year ago, we kind of agreed that we wanted to have an event-based API, but rather than just putting config filter in, into core. But we didn't really know how to put just the API into core because we need to also use the API. Um, so at DrupalCon Seattle, we, we created a plan, we created a lot of issues of how like each step in broken down little pieces on how we're gonna get this done. But then uh, as the summer progressed and life happens and not a lot of people have worked on this, um, it was getting clear that we were not going to make it and it was going to be very sad. So we had to think like, okay, how, how, can, we, how can we still do something? And we went back to the drawing board and kind of thought what, what are the expectations? What, what do we need to realign to, to still make this happen? And um, talking with uh, a couple of people in the Drupal community, we came to the conclusion that actually this original feature that Dr Drush had, that you could just skip the modules, was, was actually a, a very good use case um, that Core could have. And um, so with the help of the maintainer of config exclude, we ported it to the new API and added it uh, to Core. And because it has no UI and, and really very, very limited configuration options, it, it um, could be done relatively quickly. And so just a few weeks before the deadline, um, or a few days actually, <laughs> we managed to get everything stable and committed to, to the place it needs to be in core. So I think that's quite an, uh, um, yeah, a success <laughs> and, and something to celebrate really. Um, uh, for those who, uh, of you who are more interested, uh, there will be a session uh, later today at, uh, from 5 to 6 in um, G110 where I will go much more into detail of, of all the other things in configuration management initiative and also where there is still a lot of help needed from, from all of you. Thank you very much. Hey, a quick reminder, um, you can ask any of us questions on Twitter using the hashtag Drupal Initiatives, just saying. Um, hey, uh, I'm Wim Lears, I work in the Drupal Acceleration team at Acquia, and I'm one of the three API First Initiative coordinators. Um, the other two are the delightfully pink people standing next to me in the photo, um, Matteo from Nullabot and Gabe, who's a colleague of mine at Acquia. 
And uh, we have pretty different perspectives. We challenge each other, but usually we end up at a consensus that is better than our individual proposals. And the three of us spent uh, more than a year scrutinizing the contract module that Matteo had originally built, vetting it against the spec, getting it ready for core inclusion, and it was a huge effort, but the result is now that it's easier than ever before to build decoupled applications on Drupal. And the lower barrier to entry is really exciting. It was not just the three of us, though. People all over the world and from many companies uh, made it happen. And more than 100 people, in fact, did. Um, only about 50 of which have actually contributed code. And so more than 50 actually contributed in other ways than through code, through manual testing, improving documentation, and so on. And that has been a tremendous help. Speaking of lowering the barrier to entry, longtime uh, Drupal user Bejeebus recently returned to Drupal, and instead of running a public Drupal site, he's now running it in his basement on his home server with cron jobs importing photos from Google. And then he generates a static site by talking to JSON API, getting the content out, and he was surprised by how fun and simple it was. And he did that before this tool was available, the JSON API Explorer tool, which was built by my colleagues at Acquia, Peter and Gabe. Uh, it's a visual query builder uh, with uh, live results, and it talks to your own JSON API instance, meaning um, it's showing something actually for your site. And you can choose what to filter by, what to include, what, which fields to fetch, and so on. And it's not just that one tool that exists. Um, lots of people are building various tools. An entire ecosystem is growing around JSON API, from automatically uploading static JSON to S3, for example, to adding capabilities not yet covered by the spec, to customizations of responses, the list keeps growing. And one example that was just recently released by Elliot Ward from Interactive Investor was the JSON API reference module. I'm sure that pretty much everyone in the room here today knows what an entity reference field is. It's uh, just like that, but instead of referencing an entity in Drupal, you're referencing data in a JSON API instance. And that opens a lot of interesting new possibilities. Uh, my colleagues, Peter and Gabe, I've also been working on adding hypermedia support to JSON API, and that essentially means that you're adding relevant links depending on the state of the data. So for example, a comment that can be replied to or can be approved gets a reply link or an approve link in the JSON, which makes it very easy to build applications like the one that you're seeing here. There are Drupal community members out there operating JSON API instances today, serving millions of requests per day. They helped identify bottlenecks and helped us discover problems that we cannot discover without such big workloads. And that's also an example of non-code contributions. For example, Nikolai Dobromira from FFW played an important role in that. Our JSON API implementation can also easily be scaled to numbers even bigger than millions per day because it uses Drupal's unique caching capabilities. And this chart here is uh, powering is of a JSON API instance powering a product launch site, and at peak it was, it was uh, serving more than 300,000 requests a second. Er, 30 minutes, sorry. Um, thanks to work, big workloads like that, we were able to make JSON API a lot faster in the upcoming Drupal 8 release. And special thanks to Nikolai again, but also Jibran Ijaz from previous Next. JSON API will be at least twice as fast for everyone and three times or more faster for most of us. And no, that's not just thanks to caching, but also thanks to algorithmical improvements. And so the three of us are really proud and happy to see that Drupal's JSON API is being used widely by both enterprise and hobbyists, and we cannot wait to see how all of you will be adding to the ecosystem. Thank you. Hi, I'm Greg Anderson. I'm a core services engineer at Pantheon, and I also do a lot of open source stuff. You've probably seen me here and there on the queues doing things with Drush and some of the libraries that go into that and other similar tooly type things. And today I'm going to talk to you about another tooly type thing, which is called Composer. Uh, we've done a neat thing for Drupal 8.8.0. It's called the Composer Initiative. Of course, Drupal has been using Composer since 8.0.0, um, but now we're moving it into core with the goal of making tarballs Composer ready from the get-go. And <clears throat> it took a lot of work to do that, and we had to be really focused. And so today I wanted to talk a little bit about the things that we had to do in order to make as much progress as we did since DrupalCon Seattle. Sometimes during core, core development it can be kind of slow where issues have to just sort of sit there and wait. So uh, one of the reasons that we were able to make a lot of progress is we built on existing tools. 
Drupal Composer Drupal project, the Drupal Scaffold project, and the Webflow tools like Drupal Core Strict were already there, and the community had a good idea about how to use them, and they worked well. But even though they worked very well, we still had ideas about how to make them better. So we came together at DrupalCon Seattle, and we talked specifically about how to focus on the scaffold tool and make the configuration for that a lot better and more focused. And we had this great plan that we were going to get it all committed there at Seattle. But that didn't quite work out. It took a little bit longer than we thought it would. Um, so we started a process of holding meetings every two weeks where we could make plans and see if we could make new milestones. And we used an initiative or a format that was started by the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Initiative where we take meetings in Slack where they can happen asynchronously and it's worked out really well. Collaboration is also really important. To get your issues committed, you have to get them from needs work to RTBC, but sometimes they'll move back to needs work and we need to get them back into needs review as quickly as possible. So it helps to have two people working on the getting it to needs review step. And it's also good to have someone who's just working on the RTBC steps, because you can't RTBC your own issue. So we communicated a lot in Slack, so we could keep notes with each other and say, hey, could you help me get this back to needs review, or I need a review to get this to RTBC. And when it was ready, we'd also ping the core committers directly. And I really want to thank the core committers who really focused on our issue. We had a bunch of things that were happening simultaneously, and every now and then we'd have an issue that was blocked. And if we told the core committer that we were blocked on something, they would give us priority, and we probably couldn't have finished if they hadn't been so attentive to our needs. So if you want to get involved with initiatives and replicate some of the success, um, my first bit of advice is to keep recruiting. People are going to get busy and fall away, so you have to keep uh, evangelizing, uh, making people feel guilty doesn't work really well, but if you just show a lot of passion, if you're working on something, that gets people interested and that'll drive them to join. Uh, give good feedback. Uh, during the process, we had an issue that went to RTBC and we're all hoping to get it committed. Someone moved it back to needs work and said, oh, I'm so sorry, but that's really important because it, it take, there's a cost to waiting for that core committer if we can find out that it needs to go back to <coughs> needs work sooner. That's, that's really good to know. And uh, it's also important to be persistent. If you're learning how to be better at sports ball or trying to get an issue committed to Drupal, you're better off being really consistent and spending small amounts of time over and over again rather than having occasional spurts of really hard efforts. So remember, we're all in this together. We're going down the same road. Please uh, focus on your relationships, get those mentorship programs going, and um, you know, community is really the key to keep that persistence and continuity. And uh, if you go to g1a.io composer, that'll pop you over to your project page. Remember, you can ask questions of any of these other maintainers uh, by using Twitter, hashtag Drupal initiatives. But if you want to know more about the Composer initiative, you should probably come to the Dries note here tomorrow or our session in room G106, Wednesday at 10.15. Thanks, I hope to see a lot of you there. I'm going to be telling uh, the story of the Promote Drupal pitch deck, which is just one part of the Promote Drupal initiative. Um, and this is really the story about how this, and, um, how this project came to be. Um, my name is Suzanne Dargacheva, and uh, I, I do a lot of marketing-related activities these days, but my background's actually not in marketing over the uh, 12 years I've spent running a Drupal agency. I've developed a passion for content and um, good communication and design. And so when I saw the Promote Drupal initiative take off at DrupalCon Nashville a few years ago, I got really inspired. Um, it was launched to coordinate community efforts to promote Drupal and really get people working together to expand the, the market for Drupal. 
last year, just one year ago at Drupal Europe, I had my first chance to get involved in the effort. I actually went to an agency leaders round table um, that Rachel from the Drupal Association organized, and we had lots of really great conversations there about um, how to help agencies, like what agencies actually need. And it turns out that uh, small and medium agencies in the Drupal space really need help selling Drupal to new markets and help figuring out what messages, what content, um, people want to hear when they're considering a content management system. A lot of the times we're kind of in the Drupal space and we don't think about this bigger picture. Um, so a small group of us there at that round table, uh, Paul Johnson, Ricardo Amaro and I, came up with this notion of a, a pitch deck. We thought this would be a really easy kind of first step, something really actionable we could do uh, to give agencies a common set of talking points when, when talking about Drupal. Uh, so we set up a Trello board to kind of get ourselves organized, and we, we decided to take a really small first step, which was to get input from all those other agency leaders out there. So we put together a survey and just asked the community what they needed. And it turned out this was a great first step because we got a lot of good feedback. And we found out that something really useful for people would be able to tell, tell stories about how Drupal's used in different industries. Um, so we wanted to get a, a whole bunch of case studies um, and testimonials from around the world of how people are using Drupal, just like really good success stories that we could all draw from. And we also thought it would be good to have some key talking points. So when you're selling Drupal to higher ed or to government, you know, you really need to talk about security and accessibility. So what is some really powerful content that we can all use to just um, speak about Drupal in that way um, and focus on the points that are most salient to customers? Um, we also collected some impressive facts because there's lots of impressive facts about Drupal that we, we, um, we don't always mention. So we put together some, some facts and figures that we could include in this pitch deck, um, talking about what makes Drupal great. Now, pitch deck is not just all about content and having a message. You also need to have design. So having that passion for design uh, is really important. So I actually drew uh, some designers into this process. Um, two designers on my team stepped in and helped take the brand guidelines for Drupal. There's actually a brand book for Drupal and apply that to our pitch deck. Um, we wanted to be able to to pitch Drupal in more than one language. So Paul Johnson actually came up with this great uh, idea to manage all the pitch deck content in Drupal so we could get it localized. And that means that we can actually talk about Drupal in many different languages. So it's in the process of being translated um, now into many, many languages, which is very exciting. Um, I think this is one of the most powerful parts of the project and uh, gives it a lot of flexibility. Um, another aspect that's n now underway is that by having all of the content for the pitch deck in Drupal, we can also customize the, the uh, pitch decks themselves. So people will be able to export the slides and the deck that they want to use to pitch Drupal to their audience, whatever that is. So you can um, find out about more about Promote Drupal in general if you have other ideas for projects that you want to launch. This started last year at Drupal Europe, so there's room for more projects like this. Come to our BOF tomorrow, um, tomorrow afternoon, um, or you can reach out to me or any of the other initiative folks directly. Thanks. Well, um, here I am. Hi, I'm Ellie. I'm here to speak to you about Drupal Core Mentoring. Uh, we are a group of mentors and organizers who help people become contributors to Drupal. Um, and I guess I've been involved with mentoring since around DrupalCon Vienna, or maybe Austin. It's been a little while now. Uh, but mentoring really got started back at DrupalCon Denver. So this is our representative image from 2012 of Tim Plunkett uh, showing some folks how to work with patches. I think they may be writing a patch there. Um, but the core office hours concept really came from XJM suggesting that after a lot of success uh, with core office hours in 2011, 
we started doing that on a regular basis on IRC, and over the years grew the program to where we had 30 mentors at DrupalCon Nashville last spring, and we've brought it from around 100 contributors, learning how to contribute to like 250 um, at one of these Thursday or usually Friday contribution events at DrupalCon. Um, so a lot of what the mentors do at this point is organize around the larger Drupal events, as well as some of the camps. So this is uh, Drupal Europe last year. That's Friday morning, getting folks ready to start contributing. Um, it's sort of an ongoing cycle of what we need to do. So there's the organizing beforehand, there's the event, and then there's a lot of retrospective afterwards. So we are always um, changing and iterating on the program, and I will be speaking about that on Wednesday afternoon if anybody wants to see that. Um, I think one of the coolest things about mentoring is that there's sort of a cascade effect. So instead of just a mentor and a mentee, you have you know, mentors mentoring each other, like Kathy is an excellent example of a mentor of mentors. Um, but it's, it's also a collaborative web of people contributing and mentoring each other, and everybody is a mentor and a contributor. That's the message here. Um, oh, I should also mention adding your mentors to your Drupal.org profile is a really nice way to say thank you. Um, but mentoring should also happen places that are not these in-person events. Not everybody can make it to these. So I highly recommend, if you're not already on Drupal Slack joining, um, there are a lot of great channels available, like Drupal Diversity and Inclusion, pictured there in Nashville, uh, has a contrib space where you can find some projects to start working on. Uh, a lot of what we hear from mentors at these events is that there are sort of three different paths a new contributor takes. You might mentor someone and they are just really excited to get started at all, uh, really excited to work with the tools, to learn how to use the issue queue, some of the basics, and that's enough. Like They understand the community. It's pretty exciting. Uh, or you might mentor somebody and they have a patch committed that very day. Um, we can't always make a live commit happen, but when it does, it's amazing validation. Or you might just keep contributing on your own. And the third path is mentoring someone and then they become a mentor, which is what happened to me. This is DrupalCon Austin, I'm in the back, and those are some of the mentors who held my hand very patiently through a lot of rough times learning Drupal. Um, probably shouldn't say rough times, it's been fun, it's awesome, <laughs> but it's also really great to have somebody there who can help you and you know you can reach out to them. So if you're interested in being a mentor or a contributor, I recommend just come by our booth here in the exhibition hall where behind Maisie's blue container, which is kind of hard to miss, so we're over there. Um, and if you want to mentor, come by the mentor orientation today or Wednesday. We will show you the ropes, help you get started. And uh, the other thing I hope you all noticed in all of the presentations today is that folks need help with their initiatives. So if you already kind of know what you're doing with the issue queue, you might want to just join one of their initiatives in the general contribution room. And otherwise, come to the first time contributor workshop. Voila. Uh, I think we have one tomorrow and one on Thursday. We will help you get started uh, learning issue queue, learning, you know, maybe you just need a Drupal.org account. There are lots of different ways to contribute too. So you might need a local development environment or you might not. Um, this is a handy flow chart that Gabor put together. You can see that you, you just follow the flow chart. It's, it's there. Great chart, love charts. That's pretty much all I have to say. I probably missed some of my speaker notes, but that's cool. Um, finally, I hope all of you speakers kept this in your decks. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> Uh, if we could have the Drupal Initiatives hashtag on the screen, that'd be awesome. So as a reminder, Drupal Initiatives is available for all of us to ask questions. We do have a few, but you can keep them coming in. We do have still a few minutes. Um, I'm going to start out with one which I think is kind of easy, uh, and it is, can we participate, the collective we, participate in these initiatives? If, if someone can uh, participate in your initiative, could you please raise your hand? Yay! That's every, for those who can't see live stream, that was all of them. Um, uh, uh, I'm asking for a volunteer to answer this one. How can I get in contact with the initiatives? Is there a centralized location? Can someone give some advice for somebody out there who
who's interested and maybe inspired by a couple of these. Anybody want to volunteer for? Oh, ha, okay. I know for Drupal diversity and inclusion, come to Drupal Slack. We have a channel, hash diversity dash inclusion. If you don't know which channel, there's hashtag contribute. We'll, uh, usually someone will tell you how to get in through that or you know, hashtag composer if you want to get into the composer initiative. What Greg said, but for the API first initiative, it's the Contenta channel that you want to join. Basically, most of the initiatives have a page on Drupal.org that you can go in and you will, ha you will see the, content, the way to contact each initiative and all the channels, both on Drupal Slack and maybe uh, Drupal Chat or whatever in there. Awesome. All right. Um, there's a question. Um, if we could have maybe two people uh, answer this one. Uh, how do you organize or prioritize the, the tasks of your initiative? We can have just two people self-elect to talk about that. Two different initiatives. Um, yeah, we have a lot of contact with uh, uh, product managers about the things. Uh, yeah, that we can really accomplish in, an, uh, in a specific amount of time. And amongst ourselves, we have a lot of discussions of the things we think is important. But we use the issue queue mostly to get the work in and just prioritize from there. I can answer for Composer Initiative. For us, it was easier than maybe some of the initiatives because our tasks were fairly linear, where one would block the next. Um, but there's a whole pile of issues that are area composer, so we also added a tag, composer initiative, for just the small number of issues that we're actively working on right now. So you can always look for that tag to see the, the active things to participate in. Um, in the layout initiative, um, when we were getting layout builder stable, we had, I think, bi-weekly meetings in Drupal Slack and at Pound Layout, and also we would meet uh, frequently with the UX team and that a lot of people who weren't necessarily, I guess, considered themselves part of the layout initiative gave us a lot of good feedback. Um, again, product managers, initially when we were looking at translations and layout builder, we had a totally different idea than we got feedback from uh, framework managers and product managers as far as like, no, that idea is not what people expect. So then we changed tact. Um, so yeah. Awesome, and actually Ted, if you could hold onto the mic, because the next question is specifically for you. Um, is there any momentum in the layout builder initiative to expand the usage to cover arbitrary pages? For example, uh, those created by custom modules or custom routes or via the page builder contrib module? Um, I have not seen that. I've kind of been, the last couple months I've been doing Drupal 9 stuff. Yeah, I know Page Manager had a patch for, um, for using layout builder in Page Manager, which would give you that. Um, but if people are interested in that feature, um, you talk to us on Drupal Slack or propose an issue either in the ideas queue uh, for Drupal core or you could propose a feature directly for Layout Builder. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, next one I've got is actually not a question, but I thought I'd just share. Uh, someone feels that workspaces are awesome. So. <laughs> um, uh, Greg, if you would uh, tell us, do you think the uh, Composer will also bring more consistency to how different Drupal distributions are installed uh, and updated? I think that will probably be answered at a later time, but yes. Mm, teasing tomorrow's <laughs> keynote, perhaps. <laughs> nudge, nudge, wink, wink, yes. Um, uh, uh, actually, this is for anybody, if we maybe have uh, one or two different people answer this one. Uh, it was mentioned several times that working on the core, uh, working on core could be a challenge. Is there an initiative to change this? <laughs> Ellie? I, I, so I, I think there's definitely um, things that we can improve with how we govern core and, and how we work in core, but I do wanna highlight the fact that how we work with core and how we contribute to core has already changed a lot in the past couple of years. Uh, bringing scheduled releases to Drupal 8, semantic versioning has really made a huge difference and make it a lot easier to plan and kind of argue for getting changes into core. So I think we've already done a ton of good changes. Surely we can continue improving, but I just want to uh, bring that out, really. Um. Yeah, I would say it's, yeah, there's been a lot of, I feel like it's an ongoing initiative, maybe not named, but it's been a lot of changes. 
I mean, compared to Drupal 7, right? It's when we had like multi-year uh, release schedules, no one had the incentives to, to contrib uh, contribute to core release, so. And I, I don't know if people know about the Drupal core ideas queue where you can, if you don't feel like you want to jump in, make patches, that you can propose changes to Drupal core, or you can look through that queue to see what ideas are already out there and give feedback on them. I just wanted to highlight that sometimes it needs to be hard because it, we need to think about all the things, not just it works, it also needs to be usable, it needs to be performant, it needs to work for very big sites, for small sites, and it needs to be accessible, and that takes a lot of work and documentation. Awesome. Uh, so there are a couple questions about starting an initiative, or is there, like, I would like an initiative for something, dot, dot, dot. Uh, can anyone give advice for someone who would be interested in starting a new initiative? How to propose that, how to gather support, how to make that actually so that they could be up here. Next. So um, I would say one of the first things is first um, get together several people because for sure not everybody is going to stay after some months. The next step probably is going to be the, uh, filling an issue into the ideas uh, into uh, in from Drupal core, uh, Drupal org. That's probably one of the best ways to start checking if people is interested in that. Uh, promoting this issue and getting people um, to know about the issue, to propose more things, and after that, um, getting support to, to, to the initiative. Yep, so the, the issue queue to look at is drupal.org slash project slash ideas. And so that's where new ideas for Drupal core initiatives um, are being created, and the, the, the intent is to create a plan where you outline where you want to get and how you want to get there. But you should be doing it with multiple other people because doing it by yourself is uh, kind of impossible. Yeah, usually getting someone that actually has some experience already on Drupal core or something similar will help you reach uh, pro project product managers and, and all the things that at the end are going to give you feedback and something. So it's, an, uh, it's like the following step after that. Also, I'd like to say, if possible, get it working really, really well outside of core, and then make a pitch for why it's much better to have it as part of core. Awesome. Suzanne, we've got one for you, so if we can get a mic to Suzanne. Um, uh, how will the pitch, back, pitch deck be kept up to date as clients evolve platforms? So um, when we first made the pitch deck, like kind of the um, MVP version was just in Google Slides. Um, so it's kind of hard in there to do things like versioning, especially once you start adding translations. You can imagine then you have, you know, 100 versions of a pitch deck. It's impossible. Um, but now that all the content um, will be managed in Drupal, um, well, you know, with Drupal we can have versions of content and we can have uh, a workflow um, for for managing that, um, getting things approved or translated. So. Uh, there's endless possibilities there. Uh, I've actually got a combined question here. So do workspaces and the API initiative work together? E.g., can I specify a workspace from which to get my JSON uh, results? I, I don't think it works right out of the box, but I, there's uh, at least two companies out there that I know of that are doing some really, really exciting things with workspaces and, and JSON API. So uh, one of the examples, I think we need to do a few tweaks in, in core to make this work. You can certainly get it working in contrib, but imagine you have a JSON API per workspace. Then all of a sudden you have a very capable content hub, for example, where you can have, you know, decoupled sites kind of inherit content automatically between each other, regions, countries, um, whatever it might be. So there's definitely at least two companies out there um, that I know is using it together. Um, yeah. But it's uh, totally true that today it doesn't yet work in Drupal core, but the good thing is that Workspaces has just become stable or is about to be it's, marked. It's about to. Yeah, exactly. Um, and JSON API does have the underlying infrastructure to make it possible to do to negotiate uh, which kind of thing you want, so either revision or by workspace. And so all of the foundations are there. It's now, workspace is, is becoming stable, JSON API is already stable, so this is like 
one of the next things to do immediately after workspaces become stable. So it will be added, um, but today it's not yet possible, but I'm glad to hear that some companies are already experimenting. If you wanna know more, grab me if you see me around or, or Wim, I uh, will be able to answer more questions. Or point you to the issue to do the work. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so what I heard was this week. That's what I <laughs> Bob? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, all right. Is, does anyone know if there's an initiative to, um, uh, for a module that makes use of Eloquent? Uh, does anyone know if, if there's such a thing? Seems like a lazy web thing, but I thought I'd ask, okay. Nobody? Okay. Um, <laughs> moving on. Uh, question about configuration management. So configuration management doesn't export files that are linked to configuration fields, uh, for example, default images. Uh, will there be a fix in the future? Um, possibly. Uh, create an issue, tag it with uh, CMI2 candidate, and then um, help work on it. <laughs> like, it's, it's with all these issues. Um, if you have a need for it, and if, if, you, if you're blocked by core not having this uh, solution, and if you create a patch and add tests, and then find someone else who marks it as reviewed and tested by the community, um, then it will happen. And if nobody creates a patch, then it's uh, very difficult to make it happen. But that's why we're all here, and, and you don't necessarily have to create the patch yourself, but if you create the issue and you um, create like a, a, a buzz around it, sort of, like you, you create, um, you, you make other people know about it, and then um, maybe someone else who doesn't have this need necessarily, but knows how to fix it, can come in and, and help. So I think that's the best solution, answer to this. Fantastic. That's good advice for all of the things. Um, uh, Christina, uh, besides the new admin theme, is there room for front-end devs to help with initiatives? Sorry? Uh, actually, maybe for everyone, but uh, be besides the new admin theme, is there room for front-end devs to help with other initiatives? Um, I guess front-end devs can also help on the new admin theme because basically that's what it is. Um, but yes, also the, well, um, not really sure what, uh, where would you start with uh, JavaScript, uh, part of the initiative right now, but for sure there's there's a lot of need of front-end developers mm -hmm. with ideally with some experience on Drupal core, but not only that. So yeah, that. In, uh, in the um, uh, workflow initiative, we have some UI tweaks that we want to do as we head into maintenance mode um, uh, with our initiative. So if you're a front-end developer, do, do reach out to me and I'll, I'll be able to point you to a couple of issues uh, as well. Yeah. I also would like to point out that the media library module is close to becoming stable and um, are, there's a lot of themes out there, admin themes that are not necessarily in core but also in contrib that could have uh, a better styling uh, applied to it for the media library. So that's also something uh, really a narrow scope to work on. There's a lot of issues in the layout builder issue queue that we need front end J JavaScript e CSS work <laughs> on. So. I call first dibs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so that's a lot of opportunities. Um, um, a question about mentoring. Uh, is there any region or local mentoring for non-English speakers? Ooh, that is a good question. Uh, I think I would recommend reaching out in the contrib channel to start, because I don't know offhand of regional mentoring. Yeah. Did you? Someone down there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, but in general, um, there's more and more local Drupal associations, which would be a great place to um, start more more mentoring at the local level. Um, so if you're looking to start something in your region, um, definitely reach out to your local association and talk to them about it. Or start a local association. And as a so we're still uh, taking questions off of Drupal initiatives. We've probably only got time for one or two more. So if you still have a question, get it in now. Um, uh, if somebody wants to volunteer, maybe one or two want to uh, volunteer, 
uh, what the biggest challenges or obstacles you faced in uh, leading an initiative? Somebody who wants to be bold and speak to these things? <laughs> yeah? I mean, I think it's, a lot of us is just organizing volunteer labor is always a challenge. Um, people come in and out, and so you have to design a process where that's okay, and that those small contributions can be, like a, a drive-by contribution can still be productive. Um, in our work, it's much more, um, it's sort of driven by the energy of the people who are in the room. Um, I'm sure that's true of other ones too, but if somebody wants work on speaker diversity, then that's what gets worked on. So it's really about um, cultivating energy and cultivating for us a community so that people do want to stick around and continue the work. Like you said, guilt doesn't work very well, so you want to get people who are excited. I would say that the biggest challenge we had is just coordinating the times. You, you know, you can't do all of the processes of an in issue all by yourself. You need multiple people, and if someone goes away, then that can block an issue, and, th and that's why it's good to have a plurality of people working on things. So if someone has to go on vacation or have a life or something, then it, it, nothing, it, uh, you don't have an issue that just drags to a halt for a week. Uh, one thing I want to add, and I spoke uh, about it during, uh, during my slot, uh, sustaining an init initiative financially over a number of years uh, is also really hard. Not everyone is in a position where they have time or, or kind of the ability to contribute. So, you know, paying contributors and sustaining people to kind of year after year really bring all these issues uh, uh, to completion, that's hard. Uh, you know, apart from writing the very, very complicated co code, of course, uh, you know, sustaining uh, that has been has been quite a challenge. And now, my session on Wednesday, um, you will learn more about that. Um, Tara, are there any plans for Drupal's diversity uh, speaker training to be brought to a wider audience like DrupalCon? Uh, yeah, so uh, if you take the workshop, obviously you can take that. We're going to be doing it at DrupalCon Minneapolis. Um, and I personally am going to try to do it as many times over the next year in as many cities as I can. So um, we are definitely still working on that. And um, if you're interested, we would obviously love help getting fundraising and that kind of thing going because Jill's, this is her full-time business is running these, so we need to be able to compensate her for that. All right, with that, uh, we're going to conclude the questions part of the day. Uh, Everyone, let's, please join me in giving a round of applause one more time. <laughs> Have a fantastic DrupalCon Amsterdam, everyone.